There is a letter written to you, beloved of God, written in the most unusual paper by the one that loves you more than you can ever imagine. It is awesome. David has spoken thereof in prophecy in Psalm 19. It ties with what you will see in the night sky if you look out of your window as Passover is approaching. There is something that you can read there. But beloved, before you can open this letter, there is something that you must understand. You must know how to approach it. As the enemy is always trying to twist the word of God, you must really understand that just like with a letter from a loved one, you would most certainly not end up worshipping the paper, but turn your heart towards the one who wrote it in love for you. Beloved, this letter is written on the most unusual paper as it is written by the one that is greater than any. No matter how unusual the paper, like with an ordinary letter, turn your adoration to the writer and not the page. Seeing the unusual format of the pages used, focus your attention on the might of the writer and the majestic love of your creator for you. Never ever worship any created thing, anyone other than the God of Abram, Isaac and Jacob. Now pray that God opens his letter to you, the letter of his great love, of his glory in Messiah, as is prophesied on the unusual page of the heavens, of the night skies, of the creation of God, who is declaring, as David prophesied in Psalm 19, the glory of God which is in Messiah as day is moving on to day and night to night. Praise God, beloved, there is none like him. But please understand, do not worship creation. Do not worship the sun or the moon or the pomegranate or anything, even if God has written his testimony of Messiah therein. Please understand, it is but a letter that God has given you. It is mind-blowingly perfect prophecy. But do not fall prey to the temptations of Satan trying to pull you away. If you end up worshipping the sun or the moon, you are not worshipping your creator. You are not worshipping Messiah. God loves you and like you would with an ordinary letter. Please, beloved. Focus on the content and not the page. Please, beloved, worship God alone and never ever creation. Now read the letter and see the fearsome prophecy, the majestic love of your creator for you in what he has written in a way that nobody can do but him. So let's read the letter that God has written us and praise him alone. God's word is fearsome. Beloved God is amazing. He is the creator and he loves you. And he has given you prophecy that he has written in the Bible, but also into creation. And today we're going to spend some time with the amazing prophecy of Psalm 19, where we find that creation declaring the glory of God. In the previous video, by the grace of God, we have seen this in the pomegranate. There is a reason why this fruit is so predominant in the Bible. Because God has written fearsome testimony of what you must know in order to be redeemed. There is end time prophecy in this fruit. There is prophecy of Messiah in this fruit. And there is a reason why we find it being associated with Solomon's temple. Please, if you've missed Consider watching by clicking on the channel Name Messiah Song and you'll find the previous video of the prophecy of the pomegranate. It is amazing prophecy also for the time that we're moving into of Passover. It also ties with Psalm 19 because there we find the same, how the creation is testifying the glory of God. And in Messiah, God glorified himself. There is none like our God. So let's turn to Psalm 19, and there we read. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. 
Now, when we move into this, it's important to understand, just like with the pomegranate, we don't pray to pomegranates. We don't venerate them. We don't venerate bread and wine. All right. But God has written a love letter to us therein. The same with the moon and the sun and the stars and anything that God has created. When he has written his testimony therein, it is amazing. But we must focus like with the letter. When you read the letter, your attention is to the message and in praising the one who has written it to you, not in venerating the letter. All right. We are not to venerate the sun or the moon or the stars. It's not about that. But it's amazing to see how there is more than just the beauty of nature, more than this, just the, the, the incredible, unbelievable width thereof and depth thereof and mind-blowing proximities thereof that people are still busy discovering. It, it takes your breath away. Yes, it does declare the glory of the one that's created it. But God has actually written prophecy to us like he did with the pomegranate. Messiah is the one in whom God glorified himself. And the heavens have the testimony of Messiah, the glory of God written into them. The name of God that God has given to Moses, being the God of Abram, Isaac and Jacob. By God's grace, we have spoken about that before. But in the name that God said, I am the God of Abram, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Across those names is written the testimony of Messiah. God is the father of the multitude. God is the one in whom we are added. So that we can rejoice while we hold on like Jacob the supplanter to the heels of our brother being birthed into resurrection. God is the God of your redemption. It is written into the name that he's given Moses. And God God's glory is tied to his name. God's glory is tied to Messiah. And the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare what God has done in Messiah. It is written into the testimony of the day and the night and the lights that God has placed in heaven. Just like it is written into this. It is amazing. We must praise God forever. All right. It shows his handiwork. It shows that God is the creator. God did that. It is mind-blowing what he's done. Everything from the smallest insect to the, to the night skies. It is mind-blowing, all right, what he has done. But that he has written Messiah's testimony to us as well therein. He loves you and he wants you to know. All right? God's glory in Messiah is a revelation of his identity of being loving and just. He is the God of your life. He's the God of your creation. It's by him that you are alive. And it's by him that you will be alive eternally, being resurrected through Messiah. It is written in the sky, just like it has been written into the name of God, because God is the one that is behind this. Wow. Because it's our life. We are redeemed. We live within the glory of God. Just like we are living here on the earth, among with the light, all right? If you think of nature, how the plants and food and what we need to live comes through the light, all right? If there was not and sun shining, there can't be greenery growing, there can't be a crop, there can't be harvest, there can't be food and we will not be surviving, all right? We live through God that's given us what we need and in the spiritual level in the same manner. And in the lights that God has placed in the sky, God has placed the testimony of the light, which is Messiah. It is amazing. And David speaks hereof in this psalm by God's grace. We read in verse 2. Day unto day uttereth speech. Wow. And night unto night showeth knowledge. Beloved. The one day that is moving into the next has speech. Wow. It is the word of God. It is Messiah's testimony that is written therein. Wow. There is thus words. There is thus a message. There is a testimony that God has written as day moves into day. A day to day speech. And in 
the rest of this verse, verse 2, we also read that the same can be said of night to night. All right? So we are first now going to look at the day-to-day -day testimony, the day-to-day -day message that God has given us. And then we're going to look at the night unto night knowledge that God has written. It is amazing. All right. Now let's turn to the day-to-day -day speech. To understand this by God's grace, you need him to help you open your eyes and you need to know something because the seasons of God, the times of God is not what we currently live by. If you look at your alarm clock, you will see it turns to the new day right about midnight and then it seems as if the day is starting in the middle of the night and then ends in the middle of the night the next night, all right? And that is not the calendar of God. In God's calendar, the day starts at the final moments of the closing, all right, at dusk. And then it moves through the darkness of the night, all the way through towards the next morning, all right, culminating in the next full day. So the day starts from dusk and goes to darkness and then comes to light again. Amazing. Because therein we read what has happened to mankind. Beloved, there is a day-to-day -day utterance of speech therein. Because when God is created in the beginning, in Genesis, we read how after the creation, when everything was perfect, we find God dwelling with his people at dusk. Okay, The time of day to start. Everything was perfect in the beginning. There was Eden. There was perfect harmony. God's creation was good. But then what happened? Soon, all right, Adam and Eve fell to sin. They started disobeying him and darkness came. You see, the dusk dwelling together with God in harmony turns to the night. There is no light, right? It is dark. But then God promised them an answer to the darkness. And the answer is Messiah. Messiah is the light given as we read in John. He is the light of God day. There is a testimony from day to day of the coming of redemption to mankind in darkness that was originally perfect in dwelling with God but fallen into darkness and moving through that to the other side that is uttered from day to day. God was dwelling with his people at dusk and we find that when Messiah came he was dwelling with us. All right, Before Messiah was cut, before Messiah died there was this brief period this period of his ministry of three and a half, where he was tabernacling with us, dwelling with, with us, before the darkness came to him, before Messiah took the wrath of God, before Messiah died. Right, you see the testimony of the, the tabernacling at dusk, the deathbed and the rising of Messiah in the day, dusk, night, light testimony of day-to-day -day uttering speech and there is also speech of Messiah in the first month the first set of 30 days if you think of the first month of 30 we find the month being separated being cut being split in half right with Passover falling there in the midst the month is thus cut in two by the blood of the lamb sign that is falling there in the midst. And Messiah would be cut in two in Genesis 15, we read thereof. He is killed on Passover at the time of three, all right, being the Lamb of God under whom we can be freed from death and passed over. God commanded that the Passover must fall on the full moon. There is a reason why. Because Messiah, when he died, has brought the light into the darkness and it's a fullest brightest light wow he took our verdict away when he died and amid the people in jerusalem god was busy declaring his glory in the night sky because the darkness has received light there is a light assigned to the darkness and the light has this testimony of messiah because the moon has a testimony of waxing and waning, of growing small, of becoming so small that it has a period of not being seen at all. 
before becoming visible again. Beloved, it's Messiah's testimony that is written into that light in the night. Please, please do not misunderstand and think that you are to venerate the moon. Not at all, not at all. But please read the love letter that God has given you because as David has prophesied, and night unto night showeth knowledge. It shows the knowledge of God that loves you. It shows the knowledge of Messiah. The light has the testimony of waxing and waning, of growing small, because Messiah would come to die. Messiah would grow small. Messiah would go into his deathbed in utter humiliation of not being seen when he died and was laid in his tomb before rising up again. And that is written into the light that came into the darkness. God is awesome, isn't he? Month one is cut in two with a Passover in its midst and then the night sky is at its brightest, the fullest light bringing light into darkness, the night Messiah died. Because by Messiah we enter into life, a new year so to speak. He is cut in two as shown in Genesis 15, like the first month that's cut in half by the Passover and the light shines in the darkness. Now, staying with wisdom in the night to night and in the light that God has created in the night. The Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar. Our life, our time is weighed by the testimony of Messiah. Our life is determined by him. Beloved Messiah isn't the moon. Please again, we don't venerate the moon. Never ever do something like that. You serve God alone. But understand the love letter. Understand what God has made to us because God created us. He's made the, the, the world for us to live in. We know the earth. We see this and God is speaking to us in a language that we understand. Our life, our ability to have a year, our ability to have as many years as God desires us to have, we see the testimony of Messiah and it is fixed. The calendar is running on the lunar calendar. It is running on the moon that waxes and wanes, that brings the testimony of Messiah to you for every year and every night that you are alive. You see his testimony. Praise God. The testimony of Messiah is shown. It is shown across the day. It is shown in the night and it's shown across the month. Right, so we have seen how Messiah's testimony is written in the utterance from day to day, also in the night, from night to night, also in the month, also in the waxing and the waning of the moon, but there is more. First, let's turn to Psalm 19 again, and we read further from verse 3. There is no speech nor language where their voice isn't heard. It covers the earth. Their line is gone out all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Messiah's testimony would be going to the ends of the world. And in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, for the light. Right, remember this is speaking in a language that we understand that it's not the literal sun, of course not. But it's what it represents. It is Messiah that brings light into the darkness. Whose testimony is written in the brightest light. Also in the light that waxed and waned and rised in the light in the night we read which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race beloved this is a testimony of messiah who is our groom that we're waiting to return who is rising like a groom who rose from his grave like a groom ready to receive his bride birthing life to her, but Messiah. Who is the strong one? The only one that was able to move through darkness and rise up on the other side. Who is the only one that could die and rise, but him? Because of who he is, his identity, his sinless state. No man, no woman could do this because we are sinful. And as the punishment for sin is death, we can't rise on the other side. We're taking our punishment. We're in darkness perpetually but for him because of his identity he could do this because he was sinless he's not taking his own punishment but ours it's the only way 
He is the strong man to run a race, to enter and bring his light and rise. We find he's going forth, he's from the end of the heaven. Messiah is the one that came from heaven, beloved, that came down, tabernacling with us, going into darkness that came because of us, bringing forth and rising on the other side in his light. He is amazing. And he circuits to the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. When Messiah rose, right, at the time of the Passover, we have the brightest light. So when, if you would have lived then, you would have looked out of your window. The disciples of old devastated with what has happened, some of them still not knowing, but they would have seen the light in the night. He was in his tomb and he rose on the third day. And when the day came, the night passed into day and the bright light. And we find that Messiah, after dwelling for a time, has ascended into heaven. What happens with the full moon right in the second half of the month? We find the testimony carries on because the moon is, is slowly starting to disappear, to depart. It grows small again. And Messiah ascended right here is in heaven. And we find this process that in the end, the stars are left, right? There's the stage where the moon is no longer visible and there's only the light that is shown in the stars. And in Daniel, we read how the righteous, right, are li likened unto the stars and shining brightly like the stars. And after Messiah's ascended, his testimony is being carried by the disciples, by the Christian and Messianic Jewish people. And we are awaiting the groom's return. Okay. He is in heaven and he is coming to return. When the moon has reached its ultimate stage of smallness, it goes into disappearance at the end of the month. And then it is required that the entire Jewish population is searching for it. All right. Until two witnesses are found who testify having seen the small point of the coming of the new moon. Beloved, this is end time prophecy. God is rehearsing end time prophecy in what he ordained them to do. Because we are awaiting the return of Messiah and Messiah's testimony in the two witnesses who will be citing his soon coming approach while they testify him. Okay. So in this Jewish calendar, the next stage after the disappearance of the moon, leaving only the starlight, right? The righteous testifying Messiah behind. We have two witnesses coming to testify the soon coming, the sighting of the new moon. The new moon is rising. Messiah is approaching, beloved. That's what the witnesses are crying out. The groom is coming. The groom is coming. Be ready. You must know who he is and you must hold on to his name and testimony and not be confused in end time. The testimony of the witnesses. And the two witnesses of Revelations 11 are testifying the approach of the groom, right, of Messiah, while they are waiting his return. The next phase is the light that is starting to culminate in the full moon. The witnesses are testifying Messiah. They are testifying the light that is in Messiah. And then they are killed in Revelation 11. We read that. So again, we have the testimony of Messiah who died and rose that is written into them. The light is coming back. Together with the moon, there are stars. There are righteous leading others to righteousness. And they are visible in the night sky. And in Daniel 12 verse 3, we read, And, and those who turn the many to righteousness will be like the stars forever. Wow. Messiah's testimony is thus written across a month, starting with his birth and the sighting of the new moon and his light growing, culminating in his death, his mission complete, dying and rising, light in darkness and rising like the sun. Right? Then Messiah ascended and we find only the stars remain, 
only the righteous that leads many to righteousness that Daniel spoke of. Until the witnesses who's part of them come and testify the approach of the groom, the approach of the, the rising light that comes, right? Messiah's coming. They testify him and they are dying. Persecuted because of that, we find the brightest light. And that ties with what we find in Psalms. We read in Psalm 19, there is no speech nor language where their voice isn't heard. And isn't that true? Wherever you are, you find the stars and the sun and the moon day by day and night by night and month by month declaring the testimony that God has written in them. All right? Providing on the earthly, yes, but also in the spiritual. We live by God alone and by his redemption that is in Messiah. His testimony is shown to all people. And in end time, the witnesses and the righteous are bringing his testimony across the world, just like Messiah said. Messiah's testimony is going to all the nations and it is written into creation by God as well. God is speaking to us of Messiah in the world that is created in his word. We may absolutely never pray to creation, but God has opened to us a love letter therein formed by his hands so that we can know how much he loves us and what we need to know to live. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. It shows him as creator but also as redeemer. Wow. For their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world and in them have he set a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. Messiah's completed the race. He has died and he's rose and he is your groom and he loves you more than any earthly groom can ever love his bride. Messiah is the groom prophesied in, in Genesis 2. Adam who died in the image of deep sleep with his side parted so that the bride can come forth. He is the triumphant groom that rose. Messiah's side was parted by the sword of the Roman soldier before he rose, beloved, so that you, his bride prophesied there in the birth of Eve, can come forth. He is the rejoicing groom, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, coming out of his tomb. Beloved, the woman of songs goes into that chamber, into the green bed of Messiah, and she will rise. You're becoming one with him. You entering into your deathbed through persecution in end time, if that's coming your way. Because his bed is green, your groom's bed is green, you will rise. David is using two images here to help us understand the awesome wisdom that God has placed in creation. He speaks of the sun, the light, the fire, all right, that is having a tabernacle like a bridegroom coming out of a chamber, rejoicing a strong man that has run a race. Where does the strong one come from? Where does he end? It's in the next line. The groom, the strong man, the, the fiery light one comes from heaven. He's going forth is from the end of the heaven and he circuit unto the ends of it. He comes from heaven and he returns there. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The strong man starts from heaven and his track is a circular one, a circular one that goes and starts and finishes at the same place. He's the sent one, the given one that comes into our dimension, dies, rises and returns there. It is the groom in the circular race. That has won the race for us. The awesome strong man who is equal to a groom, our groom, coming from heaven. He is equated to the brightest fiery light. David uses the image of the sun, which is the brightest light we know on earth, to help us understand something. God is speaking to us in an earthly language that we understand. Beloved, go out and please, well, don't do this because it will damage your eyes, but you can't look at the sun. It's so bright. Messiah is brighter than the sun. 
and is perfect. God is doing something. He is placing this very bright light in the sky and is writing Messiah's testimony therein. Because the sun is seen, all right? And then it moves across the sky and then it's not seen as if dead. And then it comes up victoriously again as a groom that comes out of his room. Wow. Messiah is the one that was seen and not seen and was coming out of his chamber tomb gloriously, victoriously for us, his bride. Wow, what perfection. Messiah did this. It is a prophecy. Please don't pray to the sun. Please don't misunderstand. But how... Pray that God open your eyes so you can see how glorious he is and how true this is that the heaven is declaring the glory of God that is in Messiah. With every sunrise, each time that the sun goes down and comes up again. When did Messiah rise, beloved? But in the early hours of the morning, rising like a groom from his tomb for you. Darkness flees when the sun rises, beloved. Messiah casts out evil demons in his presence was exposed when he was near and they fear him and they fear his word and they flee before him it is the signs of Moses if you'd like please consider watching by clicking on the channel name Messiah's song and search on the video list you'll find by God's grace alone there is a video on the signs of Moses God gave Moses prophetic signs so that the people would know that he is the saint one and Messiah had those signs. So that the people would know that he is the saint one, he is the fulfillment of Moses. The one that is prophesied in Moses' life but is greater than him. The one in whom God would do greater things as he said he would. The sun, the light, the same way that John has described Messiah. He is called a groom here in Psalm 19. Messiah is that and we are his bride. And there is fearsome prophecy of the, of the Messiah to be the rejoicing groom, the conquering groom, appearing from his chamber. Beloved, because from which chamber did Messiah victoriously appear so that the bride can live with him forever, but from his tomb, which should have been ours. He opened our tomb. He opened your tomb when he rose. Beloved, when you think of that, this Passover, rejoice. He opened the tomb of your loved ones. He is the rejoicing, loving groom. It is part of his assigned path. He came to die and rise. It is his testimony that is written into the sun and into the moon. He is the strong man. There is prophecy of Messiah in Samson, the strongest man. There is prophecy of Messiah therein. If you'd like, consider watching by clicking on the channel name. But praise God alone. He alone gives his prophecies and he alone opens it and they are breathtaking. God loves you. The groom is dying for the bride. There is prophecy in the creation of Eve. If you'd like, consider watching by clicking on the channel name and praise God. Messiah fulfilled the law's punishment and we read in verse 7 that David is prophesying saying the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple Messiah fulfilled the punishment of the law and he converts our souls he turns us back to God by turning the verdict and taking it by himself his testimony is sure. God opens his wisdom so that even the smallest disregarded one can become wise. Because it's by his grace. Wisdom is from God. It's not due to the cleverness of a person. And nobody can claim any credit for his prophecies. And the wisdom of understanding it is all but his grace. And if he opens your eyes, beloved, praise him alone. He loves you. He wants you to know. God enlightens our eyes. God helps you to understand that it is true what he said in Genesis, that the punishment for sin is death. Therefore, no matter how small you think your sins may be, the punishment is death. Eve did not commit a murder there in Eden, did she? But the punishment was activated. 
If you have sinned only in your mind, you have activated the punishment. You have activated the fiery furnace that Malachi is speaking of. But God has given us grace. It's in Messiah. It's in the groom. It's in the light that comes into darkness. That every day and every night and every month is testifying. God loves you. If you understand what he has written to you in the pomegranate, if you understand what is written to you in the sun and the moon and the light and the days and the calendar that runs according to Messiah, rejoicing the heart. Beloved, when you see this, you can't but rejoice. The commandments of the Lord is pure. There can't be sin in heaven. And you don't go there in pride saying, I'm here because I'm sinless or I've done so many good things. You end up praising God there because you live by him on the earth and in heaven. We have, we have the most mind-blowingly awesome God imaginable. The only God who loves you. He opens your eyes and if he's doing so now, praise him, he loves you. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. What God has done in Messiah is the perfect solution. It's the only solution. You can never let go of him. More to be desired are they. Right? It's the judgment of God, the righteousness of God, the, the, the wisdom of God. Messiah, the glory of God. Then any gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. The word of God, Messiah, is sweeter than honey. Beloved, there is an incredible riddle that God has written into Samson's life of the lion that died to bring forth the honey. It's Messiah's testimony. You must know the answer to that riddle to get your clean set of clothing. Beloved. Please click on the channel name Messiah's Song and watch the prophecies written into Samson's life. And be wise in the end time and praise God for opening his prophecies and helping you because it's him. He loves you. He loves you. You live by Messiah, beloved, by God, your creator, who has provided for you in Messiah, just like he said he would in Genesis already. We find in verse 11, Moreover by them thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. We are sinful and you must measure yourself against the commandments and you'll discover that. All right, you will discover how much you need God and Messiah by measuring yourself. We don't even know all our faults. All right, who can understand his errors? We have secret faults, beloved. There are things that we're not even aware of that we are in sometimes in we find with, with Job as well, how he was praying for his children for things that they may be doing something wrong that they don't even know of. Right? We are very sinful. Since the fall, we are struggling with our sinfulness. We can't redeem ourselves. Don't think that you are good enough to enter heaven because of your sinless state. Don't think that you can determine on any good works to redeem you because you can't. If you have sinned once, you have activated the judgment. Eve had a perfect life up till the moment she fell into sin the same with adam and her prior state couldn't help her your good works cannot redeem you only god he cleanses you even from your secret faults we read in verse 13 keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins let them not have dominion over me then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Do not be presumptuous, beloved, in thinking that you don't need Messiah. Don't think that you are so perfect that you are sinless and you can enter into heaven counting on yourself. You're not the strong man, beloved. You are not the groom. You must be like Eve, finding a safe haven inside the groom, covered by his skin. The prophecy of the animal that died. Remember, Eve tried to cover herself there together with Adam with the fig leaves. It didn't work. Your works cannot cover your sin. God provided a cover in the animal that died's skin. 
Messiah is the lamb given. Messiah is the fulfillment of the one to die to give us a skin. Eve was under the skin of the groom. You are under the skin of Messiah, beloved, before you are birthed into resurrection. Don't be presumptuous and end in a greater transgression, thinking that you don't need the groom, that you don't need the covering because you are so good. You are not. To reject your salvation is the greatest mistake that you can ever make. Because then you have to face your punishment by yourself and you cannot. Don't do that. Don't reject what God has done for you. You cannot bring life to yourself. Just as much as a little baby cannot bring life to itself. The baby needs to be in the mother prior to its birth. You need to be in Messiah prior to yours in the spiritual. It is because of God wanting you to be here that you are living on the earth. God wanting you to be in heaven that you can go there through what he's provided. He has given you your mother's womb and he's given you Messiah too. God is awesome. Messiah has opened that womb to you. He's opened your tomb. So that you can be birthed. Just like the sun that goes down and rise up on the other side. The strong man going through his circuit. It's only him that can do it. You cannot redeem yourself. You are not your own Messiah. You cannot stand and die and rise in your name. Thinking you are sinless. You are not anybody else's Messiah either. Only the one that is coming from heaven could do this. He loves you. Then we find the most beautiful verse. And may this be your declaration together with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. My strength and my Redeemer, God loves you, beloved.